Amazing. Good grief, you guys. That was amazing. That was a message all by itself. Thank you, Cliff. Jason asked you guys before you were warmed up. Now that you're warmed up, I'll ask you again. How are you guys doing this morning? <laughs> yes. I love that. Oh, good job, guys. Good morning. I have been so excited to do this today, so thank you for having me. Um, if we haven't met yet, my name's Lori. I'm on staff here. I would love to meet you. Um, Mitch asked me to be part of the July speaker series a couple months ago, and I thought, man, not worthy, but I'm, I've been praying about it. I pray today that the Holy Spirit gives me words of wisdom that touch your heart, because I believe he's got us here together for a reason. I want to say good morning to our friends online. This is our live service, and my family's watching. Hi, guys. I also, I, I think a lot of our northern friends who go home for the summer are watching, so good morning, everybody. I know they missed this worship. Welcome. I, uh, when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a flight attendant. That was my dream. I wanted to do that more than anything. I wanted to spend my life flying. I had taken a trip at 15 with some family friends across the country. We went to California and Arizona, and we spent 10 days exploring. And it's the flight that I can remember that lit my excitement and my passion for travel. And so if you look at my high school yearbook, it says, in five years, I will be flying the friendly skies. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was back in the time when flight attendants were as uniform and polished as the rockets. And, and at five foot four, and very, very shy, that was not God's plan for me. But I still love to fly. I will get on a plane. I will go anywhere at the drop of a hat. My backpack is always ready to go. And so I thought for fun today, if you guys will let me, I will be your flight attendant for the day. And we'll go on a little trip together. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. With your seats in an upright position, your tray tables locked and stowed, your seat belts on. Are you guys ready to go? I want to mention, there are exits in the back of the church. <laughs> Hopefully you won't need them. All right. Let's go. This morning we are off to Charlotte International Airport in North Carolina. Many of you know that I have a son in the Air Force, and he's been stationed in London with his family, my daughter-in-law and my three granddaughters, for the last three years. When I found out they were coming home, I was so excited. When I found out they were going to be stationed on the East Coast, beyond excited. And so I wanted to fly to Charlotte, North Carolina, to meet their plane and be the first one to welcome them home to the United States. And so that's what I did. I took a flight from here to Charlotte, North Carolina, and I planned it so my flight would land at the same time as their flight. So when I got to Charlotte International Airport, I got off my plane, I took the mile-long hike across the airport. It's a big airport if you guys haven't been there. I took the mile-long hike across the airport to the International Terminal, and I found their gate, and I asked if it had landed, and it had. But... In order to meet them, I had to go down a level, and I had to go under the airport, and I had to go to the far corner to meet the international flight, because they had to go through customs. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> and so I went down this long, moving stairway. I went past baggage claim, and I went to the far end of the airport, and I waited. And I saw this long hallway where a lot of other people were waiting, too. It was long. It went up. It leveled off so far away from my sight that I couldn't see who was coming next. But I could tell that there was a hallway to the left-hand side, and people seemed to be coming this way and then down this long ramp. Right where I was standing, there was a huge sign that said, no entry. I'm pretty sure that sign was for me. <laughs> so I stood by the no entry sign, and I waited. And I fixed my stare on that left-hand corner, and I watched every face that came out, thinking, man, they've got to be coming pretty quickly. And I watched, and I waited, and plain loads of people came, and plain loads of people went past me to baggage claim and left. And I waited, and I watched, and I watched, and I waited for a really long time. This was about an hour later, 
There was a lady standing there with one of those signs that says a name, and she's waiting as their driver to take them where they're going. And so I said, what plane are you waiting for? And she said, Heathrow. <sighs> Relief, because that was the plane I was waiting for. And I knew if she was a driver, she'd done this before, and she'd, she knew how long it was going to take to get through customs, and she wasn't worried. And so I tried not to worry, but the wait was killing me. And I don't know about you, but wait turns into worry really easily for me. And worry has a best friend called big imagination. And when, <laughs> when worry and big imagination get together, man, the stories they can create. And so I started to think, I've missed them. Somehow, getting off of my plane and them getting off of theirs, we missed each other. Somehow, with all of those people coming down this long ramp and my eyes peeled on that left corner, they must have walked past me. But worry turning into imagination turns into something unrealistic. And that didn't make sense. But in my mind, I was thinking, man, I miss them. My coming to the airport was a surprise to them. I had my American flag ready to fly when I saw them, but they didn't know it was coming. And so I thought, all right, the surprise is on me. They're not here. <laughs> and so after a while, I just got really concerned. Don't we do that to ourselves? Don't we start to worry? And then that starts to turn into something bigger. And a lot of times, that something bigger is not even realistic. Today, I want to talk to you, and I've named my message, Hurry Up and Wait. Because in the waiting, that's all God asks us to do. I had hurried. I had gotten there as fast as I could. I'd ran to the other gate. But the only thing I had the power to do was wait. And I'm not comfortable waiting. <laughs> that's not who I am. Hurry up and wait for me feels like rollerblading really fast on a gravel road. Hurry up and wait for me feels like jogging 12 miles on a treadmill and getting nowhere. Hurry up and wait for me feels like a jackknife dive on a 70-foot platform into a kiddie pool. <laughs> Hurry up and wait is not what I do. I'm really good at one really not good at the other. Hurry up feels to me like forward-facing, posture fast, heading towards the goal. Wait <sighs> puts the brakes on. Wait is standing still, no motion, no energy. I'm not comfortable in the wait. I want to read from Galatians 6, 9, and 10, where Paul tells a young church about worrying and waiting. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap the harvest if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Paul's letter to the Galatians gives encouragement in the waiting to not grow weary, but to continue doing the good work we were called to do. I want to ask you something. What are you waiting for? Where are you putting your faith? What will you do in the waiting? Before we dig into the text, a little background about Paul so that you know where he's coming from and why he's such an expert on this topic. Paul was known as Saul during the early church. He was not a good guy. He had a reputation of ruthlessness. His job was to find and imprison Christians. He would go house to house, door to door, knocking on doors and dragging out young believers, taking them in front of the judge and imprisoning them. In Acts 9, we hear about a story of a miraculous encounter between Paul and Jesus on the road to Damascus. So miraculous and undeniable that Paul's life takes a 180 turn. He's filled with the Holy Spirit and commissioned now by Jesus to, spring, to bring Christianity to the Gentiles, those people of non-Jewish faith. The Gentiles had no hope of heaven according to the Jewish law. When Jesus came and died for our sins, all people 
have equal right to that inheritance. It was God's rescue plan for the world then. It's still God's rescue plan for us. Paul's first mission field was to share the good news in southern Turkey, in a Roman province in the region of Galatia. This is where Paul planted or established several young churches. Paul's letter to the Galatians that we're going to look at today was to all the churches that he had planted, and it was a letter of great concern. Concern isn't strong enough. Paul was livid. And Paul had a clear message that he wanted those Galatians to hear. And here's why. After Paul would go in and plant a church, a group of the religious leaders would come into the church and they would lay down the laws to live by. Now, these were Jewish converts. They were Christians, but they were bringing the Jewish law into those churches. And they were telling these young Christians, you have to be Jewish and you have to follow the Jewish law. I could see why Paul was upset. Paul, in a real way, had planted seeds of a church that was being extinguished. It wasn't growing fruit, and it was because of these leaders coming in. Paul was rightfully livid. He was outraged, and so his letter to the Galatians was clear. It, was, it is the most plain-speaking letter in the Bible today. He did not mince words. He did not budge. And this is what he said. I'm going to read this from the message version. I don't know if you're familiar with that Bible, but it's, it's very clear written in today's language. But I, th I love how it colorfully shows what Paul said to the Galatians. Here's what it says. Are you crazy? <laughs> Have someone put a spell on you? Other versions say, have you been bewitched? Have you taken leave of your senses? Man, you were baptized. You were freed from your sin by faith. You received forgiveness for the gift of eternity, and now you no longer have the crucified Jesus in sight. His sacrifice was set before you clear enough. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you something, Paul said. How did your new life begin? Was it by working your heads off to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? Are you going to continue this craziness? For only crazy people would think that they can do what only God can do. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough to begin it, you are certainly not strong enough to perfect it. Did you go through this whole painful learning process for nothing? And here's his final words to them. Christ has set us free to live a life of freedom. So take your stand. Let no one put a harness of slavery on you. Wow. If I got a letter like that from my church leader, I'd be upset. I'd also know I'd stepped way far out of bounds. I became a Christian when I was 18 years old. But to become a mature Christian will take me a lifetime. And I'm so grateful for all of the people that God has put in my place. People like Paul, along my journey, they poured into me. People have prayed for me. People have modeled their faith for me. And people have given me course correction when I needed it, just like Paul did. He goes on to say, these two ways of life that you're living are contrary to each other. Like hurry up and wait. They don't go together. You cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Choose to be led by the Spirit and escape the erratic compulsions of law-dominated existence. Man, they got off track. I can see why he was mad, and I can see why he spoke such clarity into their confusion. In all of his letters to all of his churches, Paul spoke with clarity, but he also spoke with great compassion. He also spoke with encouragement, 
If you read Paul's letters, he's always encouraging the church. He goes on to tell them it's not too late. And I love that. Paul talks about planting and harvesting. These would have been a group of farmers, and so that example would have made sense to them. You're responsible for the planting. Look around you. We've planted churches far and wide. God is responsible for the harvest. We can't make that happen, but we're called to wait in that space in between. Paul says, we worked diligently. We worked diligently. Now wait on God and his timing to see the harvest. Paul's writing to the Galatians reminds them of their freedom. Their planting, God's reaping, it's a space between that we can't be responsible for, but we can do our part, do good, wait on God's timing. He encourages the Galatians, and he encourages us to be patient. Do not become weary. Do not give up, because in due time we will reap a harvest. The payoff will come. We will see the fruit of our faithfulness. Paul continues to explain what to do in the meantime. How are you waiting? We should do good to all people whenever we have the opportunity to do so, and especially to those who are our brothers and our sisters in Christ. I don't know if you caught during Paul's message, he never uses the word you. You should wait. You should do good. Paul uses the word we and us because Paul is in it with them. In due time, we will reap the harvest. In due time, we need to not give up. We now have the benefit of knowing the impact of Paul's ministry. But Paul didn't even know the impact of his ministry at this time. Paul was getting discouraged, and he was particularly discouraged because he'd planted these new churches and wasn't seeing the fruit of his work. Paul was not a stranger to discouragement. His life was extremely difficult. Jesus had given him a path, and he stepped out in faith, but it was never easy. He was imprisoned for his beliefs and for witnessing Paul had been radically changing lives and telling people about Jesus, converting people to Christianity far and wide. The growth of the Christian church was exploding, but he spent much of his time writing these letters from prison. Paul bore the scars of beatings because of the word of Jesus Christ. In chapter 28 of Acts, we hear about a story of Paul and some friends of his who were trying to reach a new mission field by boat. Not one shipwreck, not two shipwrecks, but three shipwrecks trying to get to a new mission field. And Paul writes this, everybody on the ship had finally given up all hope of survival. Yeah, Paul knew about discouragement. He knew about despair. So when he was talking to them about not growing weary and not giving up, he knew exactly what he was talking about. He was sympathetic to them. Paul was speaking for himself just as much as he was speaking to them. Waiting to connect with a family member at an airport seemed endless. There are families in our church right now praying for a child to turn 180 and come home to your Jesus. There is a husband or a wife today praying for their spouse to come home to turn to God. Don't give up. Keep praying. Put your faith in God. Let him do the harvest and stand in that space where he is faithful. For young families raising little ones right now, I know the work is hard. Plant good seeds. Don't grow weary. Wait. Does it help to know that God is your partner in making that harvest rich and fruitful? There are about 40 people who recently went into the Gulf to be baptized, to be cleansed of your sins, and to proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have had your own miraculous encounter with Jesus. Stand in that faith. Be strong in that faith. Allow the waiting to grow you, because that's where God will meet you. Maybe God has laid on your heart to plant a ministry and you have not yet seen the fruit. Do good. 
don't grow weary. Plant and wait. His timing, God is faithful to the harvest. Don't grow weary from doing good for God is faithful and he is responsible for the harvest. Second Peter 3, 9 tells us the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some consider slowness. Gosh, I consider slowness so painful. God is not slow as I consider slowness, but he is patient towards you. Not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. If you knew that you were waiting for God to work in someone's heart, would, you, would that make the waiting easier? If you knew that you were waiting for God to fulfill your prayers for someone that's burdening your heart, would that make the wait easier? Paul's reassurance to these young churches was to claim the freedom they received by grace to continue to grow and to minister to each other and to stand in the faith that God was able to complete the harvest. As we begin our final descent into Charlotte International Airport, I want to let you know how the rest of the story went. After a long wait, I decided to take in what I could see, an Indian family waiting with me, and down the ramp came two wheelchairs with a grandma and a granddad. And I wondered, man, how long had they waited for that family reunion? How far had that couple traveled to see their family? I saw visitors from other countries landing in America for the very first time, and I was able to point baggage claim to them and the exit. I saw college students coming home from study abroad, and I thought, man, their eyes must have been so opened to the world this year. I found that the time went more quickly as I soaked up the stories in front of me. There was nothing I could do to speed things along. There was no way I could stand on my tiptoes and see over that incline. I couldn't see around corners. I could just wait. As I kept my eyes on that left-hand corner, I saw two familiar faces popping up over the incline. I saw two luggage racks packed with luggage I saw a stroller with two babies and a four-year-old leading the parade. My harvest. God's good, and he completes the harvest if we wait. I had an American flag, and I was flying it. I saw my daughter-in-law's eyes, and she was crying, and I was crying. And if we weren't crying and waving flags, I would have taken a picture to show you guys. What a harvest. God is so good. It's his timing, not mine, and it was worth it. The waiting the wondering, the wishing for a better view, for more information, worth it for the hugs I got. I had time to reflect during this time of waiting, and I've reflected since. There are so many times that I bend my head sideways. There are so many times when I stand on my tiptoes and I want to see ahead. What's going to happen? God says he has the better perspective. He's in charge of the harvest, and he's working all things for good. Waiting in partnership with God, who loves us and knows us intimately, he wants the best for us. Not what we can muster on our own strength, but the very best he has to offer. Isaiah 40, 31 says, They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and they shall not grow weary, they shall walk and not faint. If you are waiting for a sweet reunion or a prodigal child to return home, a breakthrough, an answer, a loved one's heart to turn towards God or a ministry to bear fruit, I wanna pray for your strength in the waiting and for God's timing in the harvest. What are you waiting for? What, where have you placed your faith? And what are you doing while you're waiting? Will you stand with me so I can pray for us? Father, you are so, so good. And you know us so well. And part of that not wanting to wait is such a maturity. Lord Jesus, I pray for you to grow me as a mature Christian. Fill me with the understanding that you have got it all under control. 
Father, I pray right now for someone in our church whose heart is just so burdened. They've been waiting so long. Pray that they don't grow weary. I pray for your strength, Father. Lift them up. Show them today that, Father, you are our partner in the harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. The captain has now single unbuttoned your seatbelts. You are free to leave. <laughs> Thank you guys so much.